मेन डाउट ऑन होमोसेक्शुअलिटी लाइक इज इट प्रोहिबिटेड इन इस्लाम एंड वाई सो बिकॉज लाइक आई हैड लाइक फ्रॉम द पास फाइव ईयर्स आई हैव बीन विद सो मेनी होमोसेक्शुअल्स इट्स लाइक आई मीन दे आर फीलिंग्स दैट दे हैव फॉर फॉर द सेम सेक्स और वट एवर इट इज इट्स सो ट्रू आई मीन इट्स लाइक द सेम काइंड ऑफ पेन वट वी माइट फील फॉर फॉर मे बी आर हजबेंड्स और वो एवर इट इज इफ इट्स रॉन्ग वाई इज इट रॉन्ग That is an interesting question. Why is it that Islam has an issue with homosexuality? Is the answer going to be better than the Quran says so? I guess we'll have to find out. Next time on Dragon Ball Z. Alrighty, how's it going, everyone? If you are new to my channel, then please hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon so that you can know when new episodes come out. Past that, we're gonna get into fan art before getting right into the video. So first, we have a sketch from Zechariah, a Sans Suris from Rosa Chan, and then another sketch from Rosa ninety nine. As always, thank you all for your fan art submissions, and let's get right into the video. This is the question that what does Islam say about homosexuality, and if it's wrong, why it is wrong? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32, that come not close to adultery, for adultery is an evil opening other roads to evil. Wow, I wasn't aware I'd be able to accuse the Quran of a slippery slope fallacy from the beginning. Moreover, also a category error. So first, the slippery slope. There is nothing that indicates that somebody will fall into other evils, or there is a gateway to other evils that begins with adultery. This is not to say that adultery is good. Cheating is not a good thing to do in a relationship. But there's nothing about being gay that suddenly means that you are cheating. Hence the category error. Unless Zakir Naik is just trying to bring this up as some way to make himself sound smart and that he knows more verses in the Quran, which he is apt to do. Besides that, Allah says in Surah Araf, chapter number seven, that telling to men that do you practice your lust after men in preference to women? That means. Homosexuality is prohibited in Islam, in the Quran, because Almighty God made the human beings. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Rum, chapter number thirty, verse number twenty-one, that He has put love between the hearts of husband and wife. Almighty God has made the human beings in such a way that they love the opposite sex. Okay, so this is just an argument from authority. This doesn't actually mean anything. When she asked, "Why is it wrong?" all you answer with is, "God made it in such a way that it is wrong for them to love each other." And the reason that Zakir Nai gives is that apparently the love between a man and a woman will manifest differently than the love between a man and a man, a woman and a woman, or anything in between. Let's be inclusive to our guys, gals, and NB pals. But if you guys remember, the woman actually said that the love that men feel towards men that she had experienced was just as strong, and their pain was just as strong. As the love that men feel towards women, and vice versa. So in this, Zakir is literally deflecting by just saying it's different, but he doesn't give any substantial reason as to why it's different, besides an argument from authority. He doesn't explain the mechanism that causes this love to be any different between different people. He's just content, telling his audience that God said so. Generally, naturally, no human being loves the same sex. And do you have any data on that? Because there are plenty of people who naturally love the same sex or the same gender. They weren't coerced into doing so or artificially changed into doing so. Do you have any data or anything to show that people don't naturally fall in love with the same sex or gender? Or is this simply an assertion? I'm talking about the love which is required in husband and wife. And here again, he's using the deflecting tactic. He's going to say that a man and a man can't love each other with the love that is required for a husband and wife. But he's not going to say why, or at least the why he gives isn't substantive. This is the "my dad said so, so you have to listen to me" style of argument. Not the platonic love, which you have between your brothers and between your sisters. Now, initially, there was a research. Which said that homosexuality is genetic. 
So during question and answer time, somebody asked me, the way you're asking, if homosexuality is genetic, then how is that human being to blame? It came from his parents, so why is he to blame? Like you're saying, if someone loves someone else, so why should he be blamed? I said, this is a research. This is a hypothesis. It's not a fact. Would that you applied that same level of scrutiny to your own religion. You might actually find yourself not being in it, or at least coming at it a different way. But if we were to actually talk about the data that has been shown, as of 2019 in a giant meta-study on genetic basis for human sexuality, it was found that there's about five DNA markers associated with sexual behavior. However, none of those have the power to predict the sexuality of an individual. This is because there are more factors involved to sexual attraction besides simple DNA markers. You can consider epigenetics as an example, where the DNA itself does not change, and yet the expression can be changed. This is because there are many genes that you have that are either active or inactive, and what switches them on and off can be changed by environmental factors. Speaking of, there are environmental factors to consider as well. As of right now, scientists do not know the exact cause of sexual orientation, but they theorize that it is a complex interplay of genetic, hormonal, and environmental influences. That also said, we do have instances where people fall in love with the sex that they are not supposed to be attracted to. That is, straight people falling into homosexual relationships, and homosexuals end up finding themselves in straight relationships. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. This basically is to say, sexual attraction attraction and even romantic attraction are incredibly complicated. And none of these things can be considered a choice. You don't choose to love someone. So Zakir Naik can deflect this entire thing by saying that, oh, it's just a hypothesis. But even if it isn't, even if genes didn't play a part in the attraction that someone happens to have, that attraction itself isn't even that much of a choice. I can grant the premise even further by saying that even if it was a choice, and we ignore all the data, including environmental factors, genetic factors, etc., what are we left with? We're left with consenting adults who happen to want to do something that doesn't harm anyone else. The worst thing that Zakir Naik might be able to say is that it offends God, but let me throw another monkey wrench into here. In Islam, like in Christianity, God is an absolute concept. Allah is all-powerful and all-knowing as the ruler of the universe. This means that even if there was a subjective choice to be made in your personal attraction, Allah already engineered deterministically the circumstances that would lead you to be attracted to that person in the first place. And then, like an abuser, after engineering the circumstances such that you had no choice but to fall in love with a particular individual, condemned that love as a sin. If he's all-knowing, he knew this was going to happen. Moreover, you didn't have a choice in the matter. If Allah knew you were going to fall in love with this person 20 years ago, you couldn't have changed that. That path had been set out before you already, and if he's all-powerful, he had every ability to divert you from that path, elsewise chose not to. You could give up some of these powers that Allah has in your mind in order to contort him into not being responsible for this relationship, but as he's conceptualized in the Quran, Allah is ultimately responsible for any relationship that happens to fall out of his accepted paradigm. If your God's all-knowing and all-powerful, it's your God's fault someone's gay. And later on we came to know that this hypothesis was wrong and the person who propounded this hypothesis he himself was a homosexual. Well, A, that doesn't matter, and again, we found that there are five genetic markers that actually lead to these types of things, though what exact role they play in sexuality we don't know. But I already illustrated before why none of that matters, that's all a red herring. Also, can I just say that if you're going to say that the person who proposed the hypothesis being a homosexual is a bad thing when they're trying to explain a particular hypothesis, then by that same notion, you being being a Muslim scholar is now a bad thing when trying to explain the whims of Allah. 
if you are to be consistent, you would have to accept that you have just as much bias as you want to claim this researcher did, which puts you in a precarious position as somebody who tries to convert people to Islam. So homosexuality is not genetic. It comes, today science tells us, how do homosexuals evolve? Because what Almighty God has given permission for a human being, what's permitted? You get married, do nikah, you can have sex with your wife. And Islam says that while doing, having sex with your wife is also worshipping Allah. Having sex with your wife is worshipping Allah? Okay, so that's a bit weird, and let me explain why. Within the context of Islam, I'm sure that sex being a type of ritual isn't in itself seen as a negative thing, but let me lay out a picture for everybody in the audience to maybe explain why this is a bit of a problem. If a man having sex with his wife is a form of worship for Allah, if a wife denies sex to her husband, within this framework, she is essentially denying the religious ability for her husband to worship in this particular way. This now puts the woman's body as a potential bulwark between the man and his ability to worship his god. So now there's a bit of a burden that the wife has to bear. If the man wants to have sex, he's not just wanting to commit coitus, he's also wanting to engage in a religious practice. And who is the wife to stand in the way of him engaging in that religious practice? This problem is compounded by the fact that if through this framework it is also worship for the wife to have sex with her husband, even if she does not want to have sex, even if she does not want to relinquish the use of her body to her partner, there is now in both of their minds a divine imperative that is forcing the woman to have sex. I also shouldn't have to point out that this also forces the man to have sex in situations that he might not want to, but given how patriarchal and misogynist Islam is as a religion, I don't think I'd need to point out who this affects the most. Because you're preventing the haram, you're not going outside the marital bond to satisfy your urges. That's Islam. Today science tells us, today research tells us, that those people who have multiple life partners outside the marriage bond, as compared to those who only have with the spouses, they enjoy their sexual life much better than the others. So I'm 100% certain you're not going to cite a source for that. Like, you're just going to say today's research, today's science, which is something that you don't even freaking understand. The closest I was able to find to this research was a piece by Susan Lang on how committed your relationship is, goes hand in hand with happiness and well-being. It's a report on a study, and I'll be linking all that in the description below as usual. But on an arbitrary happiness scale, the research shows that having a romantic relationship makes you happier, and the stronger the relationship and commitment, the happier you are. There is nothing in this research that says that gay people who are in loving marriages are any less happy than straight people. And it should also be noted that given society's proclivity for celebrating straight marriages and not doing the same for gay marriages, even if the data suggests that they weren't as happy, there would be other environmental factors that would lead to that. Obviously. What Zakir Naik is doing here is attempting to explain that married couples are happier, so men and women being together is good, and unmarried couples are not as happy, and people who have more sexual partners are not as happy, therefore being gay is bad. This is a thing that he likes to do a lot, where he tries to tie in Quranic messages with research that he has thrown out of his butthole. Except the problem here is, again, a category error, something that he's definitely familiar with by now. If you are to measure the categories accurately, you would need to measure happily married gay couples of a certain length of time, and then happily married straight couples of the same length of time. You cannot say happily married couples in one category and then compare them to something that's in a completely separate category, which is people having multiple partners or people having flings. 
When you compare these two categories, you will ultimately get different results. But Zakir Naik, being the person on stage and thus the person in control of the conversation, is able to pull this verbal trickery without being challenged on it. You'll notice this is the exact same kind of verbal trickery that people like Ben Shapiro and Steven Crowder so often use. And what happens today when you get tired with it, you go to the Western countries, you have mistresses. 5, 10, 20, no problem. You start then doing unnatural things. When you start doing unnatural things, you don't follow the law of the creator and you try and satisfy your urges in the wrong way. I don't think I need to explain the fact that he's arbitrarily labeling things as unnatural. He's speaking through a microphone. This is communicating in an unnatural way. He's broadcasting what he's saying over a television set. This is communicating in an unnatural way. If you happen to have sex and you use a condom, that is having sex in an unnatural way. Hell, if your knees hurt during sex and you have to use a memory foam mattress in order to prevent that pain, you're technically having sex in an unnatural way. If Zakir got to this conference in a vehicle, he engaged in transportation in an unnatural way. This natural slash unnatural divide is used very often, but in reality, this is basically just an appeal to antiquity fallacy. The natural order of things is much older and therefore considered much more good. But there's nothing about how natural or organic something is that makes it better or worse inherently. Again, he's speaking to his audience through an unnatural means. And as usual, he has to fall back on the idea that these are things the creator wants. These are things that Allah demands. Which means that all of the scientific stuff that he tries to jam into his argument arbitrarily are all red herrings. None of them matter. The actual crux of his argument is that Allah said so, so it must be true. The moment you keep on doing the wrong way, then you keep on going beyond what is natural, and that's how the person becomes homosexual. Two things. One, slippery slope fallacy. Two, there are people that know for a fact that they are not going to be interested in women by the time they're 12 or 13. I knew for a fact when I was that age what I was sexually attracted to. And while those attractions may have broadened a bit over time, the fact of the matter is I knew I was straight and I've been straight ever since. And that is the way it is for a lot of people when they're given the ability to explore that. Luckily, I had internet access, so I had the ability to explore that pretty thoroughly. Whether or not I should have is a different story, but we're not talking about that. If Zakir Naik's argument were actually true and corresponded with reality, then we would expect that any kid who knows by the time they're in high school that they're not gonna be attracted to women they would have had to have multiple mistresses or engaged in several unnatural acts or something before they actually came to the conclusion that they were homosexual. But that's not really the case. What Zakir Naik is doing here is essentially trying to paint homosexuality as some sort of unnatural abomination against God that people chose to get into by falling down a slippery slope of sin. But the fact of the matter is, the science is not settled on what actually causes attraction. We have a lot of different variables that we have to look into when determining these things, and all these things only point us down some roads. They don't necessarily lead us to destinations. Which means anybody trying to claim that they know 110% for a fact what causes anyone's sexuality is lying to you. They don't know. They can't know. That is knowledge that is not currently grasped by man. Prometheus has not chucked that particular fire into our retinas. It is not genetic. Because you go beyond the limits what Almighty God has permitted you. It's not genetic because you went beyond some arbitrary lines that a deity threw out. I'm not sure you understand what genetic means. Then again, this whole conversation has been a great example of that. You try other things, you try unnatural things, and finally you land up by saying you, you no longer enjoy having sex with the opposite sex, so you have sex with the same sex. 
And again, that's not what the science actually shows happens with attraction. Attraction generally is put into place much earlier than that, and even when it's put into place, sometimes people can end up falling in love in ways they didn't expect. In my 28 years on Earth, I've at least met one lesbian who circumstantially found themselves in a relationship with a man. So sister, because they've broken the law of Almighty God, and they do unnatural things, that's how psychologically they become a homosexual. Ah yes, I can see it now. 15 year old discovers their sexuality for the first time in high school because they engaged on a psychological slippery slope against the winds of Allah. And if it sounds like nonsense, that's because it is. So but naturally if you break the law of Almighty God, that's totally wrong. And that's how it lands up a person being homosexual. So they are to blame. And Islam prohibits homosexuality. Even Christianity prohibits homosexuality. Most of the religions are against homosexuals. And as I said earlier in the video, he has to resort to the crux of his argument, which is Allah says bad, therefore bad. Which I'm fairly certain that she was looking for a more substantive answer besides Islam says it's bad. Also, everybody else should probably have gotten their fallacy bingo card scratched in a bit when he said Christianity and most other religions prohibit homosexuality. Whether or not that statement is true doesn't actually matter. The fact of the matter is, that's an argumentum ad populum fallacy. It doesn't matter if the majority of the world thinks something is wrong that doesn't automatically make it wrong or untrue. You have to try to look at why they say it's wrong. And if most people think that homosexuality is wrong because of piss poor reasoning, like what Zakir Naik is given here, then they're believing for the wrong reasons. It's now the Western countries are saying, because in democracy, whatever majority says, you win, majority wins. In Islam, majority doesn't win, the haq wins. The truth wins. You say the truth wins, but you haven't given any examples as to why it's the truth. You haven't backed up your assertions at all outside of saying God said so. I remember when I'd gone to Canada in 1996, the first time I went to give a lecture, in the front page I saw a man kissing a man. A man kissing a man, and it says that they have married each other. Today in Western countries, if I speak against homosexuality, it's a crime. It's a crime. No, not really. I live in a Western country and people are able to speak against homosexuality all they want. It's not a crime. In fact, actually, even when it's considered hate speech, that's completely protected by us, a Western country. But I think the real reason that you're doing this is you spent an entire portion of this lecture arguing that homosexuality is bad because God says so. And then afterwards explaining that you've gone to the West and the West says homosexuality is good. Therefore, the West must be bad because they criminalize saying that homosexuality is bad, which isn't even a thing that really happens. This then gives you the ability to say that the West is bad. And I hope I don't need to remind anybody here, but that kind of tribalistic thinking that everything in this region of the world must be bad is what easily leads us down the path of war. When we start thinking of things in black and white, instead of thinking about the nuance of things and the reasons why people believe the things they do, we have a tendency to make everybody around us the other or the enemy. This allows us to dehumanize people who we thoroughly otherized, and if a conflict were to happen, any collateral damage from that side would be justified because, well, they're the other. Whatever happens to them is fine, because they're evil. So what we realize, that previously, previously, all the countries homosexuality was a crime. That is not something backed up by historical data, but go on. Then some Western countries like Canada, gave legal sanction to it. Today, most of the Western countries, homosexuality is legal. Even India, the country where I come from, they are thinking. They are thinking to make it legal. So what we realize, what is truth is truth. Majority doesn't win. What is wrong is wrong. And in Islam and most of the major religions of the world, homosexuality is a sin. It's a crime. It will not take you to heaven. It will take you to hell. So you're going to say through one side of your mouth that 
An argument about populism is bad. It doesn't matter if the majority of countries in the world say that homosexuality is wrong or right. And I at least agree with that, because majority opinion doesn't matter in that case. That's just a matter of argument about populum. But then, through the other side of your mouth, you say that the majority of religions say it's wrong, so it's wrong and a crime. You do realize that those are the same statement. You're just being nightmarishly inconsistent. You happen to view religions as an authority that you approve of. As a result, you don't have an issue with them being used for your fallacious reasoning. And because you don't view democracy as a legitimate form of governing people or a legitimate form of passing down laws people can or can't abide by, then it's bad when they use majority opinion in order to make a decision. None of those matter. And I think you realize that, which is why all of that was a red herring. All of that is an attempt to try to lump a whole bunch of assertions together in order to make a stronger case. But in reality, your case is this. Allah says it's wrong, so it's wrong. That's it. All the scientific stuff you brought up is either bunk or doesn't matter. The points about democracy is either bunk, doesn't matter, or is used as a method to otherize. And your points about Christianity and other religions are red herrings and do not matter. The crux of your argument is just an argument from authority. And I can't accept that kind of fallacious reasoning, and I don't think anybody else should either. If you're watching this video and you've had a conversation like this with somebody about LGBTQ individuals or homosexuality, I hope you can take something away from this. Take away the ability to spot red herrings. Take away the ability to see when there are points brought up in a conversation like this that do not ultimately matter for the conclusion of the conversation. Isolate the real reason somebody believes something. In many cases, they just believe that homosexuality is icky, and then they lump all of the possible things they can in order to try to come to their conclusion that they've already reached. This is called confirmation bias. It's where we seek out information that leads us to the conclusion we've already stood at the entire time. If you are to come to the truth of any proposition, you need to look at all of the information period, not just the information that confirms your bias. I would also hope that anybody watching this video will take away that sometimes people throwing all of that confirmation bias that they've sought at you is just a red herring for what's really boiling underneath. So if you've had this kind of uncomfortable conversation with a parent or a friend or anything like that, maybe you should try having that conversation again with some of these tools in mind. Figure out why they actually stand by the assertions that they do, and when they give you bad reasoning, point out why it's bad. You may discover some things about the people close to you that you're not very comfortable with, but you might also change their minds for the better when they're forced to reflect inward and realize that their reasoning was just personal disgust in some cases. But with all that said, if you enjoyed the video, please let me know in the comment section below. Hit the like button and do whatever you want to support the channel. Patreon is an option as well. Uh, if you are seeing this portion of the video, you should be seeing the Patreon slides come up. These are for anybody who has been a $20 and higher patron for at least a month. I am not always the fastest at getting these things prepared, though, so I apologize for that. But I do want to thank every one of my patrons who is subscribed at that tier, or really any tier. You guys are the reason I'm able to keep doing this on this channel. Through burnout, through demonetizations, through channels getting hijacked, you guys have been here the whole time. So thank you for that. And as always, everyone, insert end of video tagline here. <laughs>